Hello citizens of the internet. Today I am going to discuss a very important topic, eclampsia. It is one of the leading causes of maternal mortality in both industrialized and developing countries. Along with severe preeclampsia and HELP syndrome, it forms part of the deadly triad of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. It is also responsible for iatrogenic preterm delivery leading to a lot of neonatal morbidity and mortality. In order to understand the management better, I am going to discuss it in a question and answer format whenever possible. I have also divided the topic into two parts. In the first part, I will discuss the general aspects and stabilization of the patient. And in the second part, I will talk about the various medications used to control seizures and blood pressure and of course the obstetric and postnatal management of the patient. In order to understand the management of this dreadful obstetrics complication, it is imperative that you watch my other related videos, Preeclampsia Part 1, Preeclampsia Part 2 where I have discussed the pathophysiology of the disease, especially how our understanding of the etiopathology has changed in recent times. Preeclampsia part 3, where I outline the management of preeclampsia. In part 4, I have discussed postpartum preeclampsia. And please also watch other individual videos on the drugs essential for the management of the disease that is magnesium sulfate, alpha methyl dopa and labetalol. To give you an overview, I will be discussing the topic under the following sections. Step 1. General aspects of eclampsia. Step 2. Stabilizing the patient in a primary and then tertiary care setting. Step 3. Medical management which comprises two parts, control and prevention of seizures and management of hypertensive crisis. Step 4. Obstetric management of eclampsia and Step 5. Postnatal management of eclampsia. How does one define eclampsia? Eclampsia is a new onset of one or more typical symmetrical grand mal seizures in a pregnant patient with preeclampsia or sometimes gestational hypertension. Hypertensive crisis is defined as acute onset severe hypertension that is accurately measured using standard techniques and associated with symptoms. The criteria being systolic blood pressure greater than 160 millimeters of mercury and or diastolic blood pressure greater than or equal to 110 millimeters of mercury. This should be persistent for 15 minutes or more. Please remember that as per our current understanding, systolic blood pressure is more important in predicting a seizure or cerebral injury than diastolic blood pressure. As far as the timing of occurrence is concerned, preeclamptic patients present with a seizure during pregnancy in 50% of cases. This is called antepartum eclampsia. About 30% of these patients first present with a convulsion during labor when it is referred to as intrapartum eclampsia. But the more important subset of eclamptic patients are those who present with a convulsion after delivery, the so-called postpartum eclamptics who account for the remaining 20% of cases. One has to worry about this group the most because they have the highest maternal mortality. A typical eclamptic seizure has the following stages. Pre-invasive phase where they have some premonitory symptoms followed by a tonic phase which lasts for about 20 to 30 seconds followed by a characteristic clonic phase which lasts for about half a minute to three minutes and then patient goes for hours into deep sleep or coma. The exact cause of these seizures is unknown. There are many theories such as cerebral vessels, vasospasm, ischemia, intracranial hemorrhage, cerebral edema, 
or formation of microthrombi in cerebral blood vessels. Hypertensive encephalopathy is defined as an acute condition resulting from acute and severe hypertension followed by severe increase in intracranial pressure. The three most common symptoms or signs that precede the onset of a seizure are headache, hyperreflexia and proteinuria occurring in more than 80% of cases. The other common antecedent symptoms are edema, clonus, visual disturbances and epigastric pain because of stretching of the liver capsule. Having said that, it is important to remember that 20% of patients who present with a eclamptic seizure do not have any prior symptoms, neither do they have any abnormal laboratory reports. As mentioned earlier, I will now present a case. A 20-year-old primary gravida is brought to a primary health center with a history of sudden onset of a convulsion. She is 32 weeks. Blood pressure is 164 by 112 millimeters of mercury. You are the primary obstetrician on duty. What will you do? Well, the usual answer is, since this is an obstetric emergency, I will straight away transfer her to a tertiary care hospital for further management. However, the correct answer is, I will first stabilize the patient with whatever first aid measures I have at my disposal at the primary health center and then when she is stable, I will transfer her to a tertiary care center. Now that the patient has been admitted in the tertiary care hospital, I will rephrase the question. How will you manage an eclamptic patient in a tertiary care hospital setting? The usual answer will be, I will load her up with magnesium sulfate and perform an immediate caesarean delivery because the baby has to be out as fast as possible. This is the most incorrect thing to do and yet believe me in most institutions especially India this is exactly what is done. Well the correct thing to do is to stabilize the patient before attempting to deliver her. I will explain later what this entails. Stabilizing the patient entails two parts. First, general nursing care and then medications to stabilize the blood pressure and stop further seizures. Both equally important. In this part one, I will discuss the general aspects of stabilization of the patient. First of all, place the patient supine on a low cot, perform a nasopharyngeal suction to keep the airway clean, put a plastic mouth gag to prevent a tongue bite, give moist nasal oxygen for some time immediately after a seizure, insert a self-retaining Foley's catheter to monitor urine output, collect blood for lab investigations. Since these patients have decreased intravascular volume and leaky blood vessels, Ristic fluids to about 80 ml per hour. All in all, the patient should be treated like an unconscious patient. One more thing, don't banish her into some dingy, poorly lit, isolated room away from the nursing station as was done in the bygone era. Instead, put her in a well-illuminated, aerated, spacious room equipped with an oxygen cylinder or central oxygen, suction machine, infusion pump and of course an eclampsia kit. It goes without saying that the room should be close to a nursing station for close observation of the patient. Remember, eclamptics need silence and not darkness. While taking measures to sterilize the patient, don't forget to collect blood for the following laboratory investigations. Urine for proteinuria, CBC, serum electrolytes, serum protein, serum creatinine and coagulation profile. I will discuss the importance of some of these investigations with special reference to the current changes in the importance given to these investigations. First, I will discuss proteinuria. Since we don't have time to diagnose significant proteinuria based on 24-hour urine estimation, what do we do? Well, the simplest answer is to do protein-creatinine ratio. A ratio greater than or equal to 0.3 indicates proteinuria. 
and a level greater than 0.7 indicates severe proteinuria. One plus dipstick test for urine albumin also indicates proteinuria, but it is not very reliable. For example, a dipstick test may be negative and yet 24-hour urine estimation may show greater than 300 mg protein in urine. Please remember the recent changes in the recommendations for management as far as proteinuria is concerned are as follows. Unlike the earlier thinking, the degree of proteinuria is not considered a prognostic factor for severity of disease anymore. Once significant proteinuria is demonstrated, there is no need to repeat it. Another investigation important for diagnosis of severity, especially renal damage, is serum creatinine level. A value greater than 1.1 or its doubling from the baseline levels measured earlier indicate renal insufficiency. An ominous sign. Please note that the normal level of serum creatinine in pregnant women is 0.4 to 0.5 mg per deciliter, which is half of what is considered normal in non-pregnant state. The other comorbid indicators of severity of disease process are platelet count less than 100,000 per cubic millimeter, liver enzymes elevated to twice the normal level, headache, visual disturbances, epigastric pain, and last but not the least, pulmonary edema. Remember, this is another new addition to the list of ominous signs for severity of disease. This brings me to the end of part 1 of my e-lecture on Clampsia. Please watch part 2, the link to which is given below. Lastly, an appeal to students attending this masterclass. Please read my textbooks Modern Gynecology, Modern Obstetrics, whose new fourth edition has just been released, and the ever popular Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology. I have also published two question answer books which are particularly useful for exam going students. These are Clinical Cases in Obstetrics, 1000 plus questions and answers, and Clinical Cases in Gynecology, 1000 plus questions and answers. These are also available on Amazon.in. You can also follow me on other social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. The links are given here. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button share it with your friends and also subscribe to my channel for more videos like this. Thank you for watching.